Hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting us to speak with you. Uh, so Doug and I are from the Rutgers Center for Fisheries and Ocean Sustainability. Um, and my portion of the talk is going to be broken up into three different parts. I'm going to talk to you about how I became a marine biologist, with air quotes. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Center for Fisheries and Ocean Sustainability. And then I'm going to talk to you about tracking Chad and River Herring along the Raritan River. Ambitious, so let's get going. So I grew up uh, surrounded by water gardens and aquariums uh, at my grandparents' house. And from a young age, I was always interested in the natural world. Um, I ended up going to college and getting an undergraduate degree and my master's degree in oceanography. But unlike most of my peers that got into the field from the angle of fishing, I was actually interested in aquariums. And so I started with a Walmart special, two and a half gallon Bowfront tank. And as my interest grew and I read as much as I could about fish keeping, so did my, um, so did what I wanted to keep. So I, I got into planted aquariums and I started keeping different types of fish. I got into keeping uh, African cichlids, into keeping discus. And of course, throughout all this, the um, reef fish were always the most you know, desirable and pretty of the fish. And so I soon found myself into reef keeping. And it was at this point that I really began to appreciate all the different systems that go into keeping a reef tank alive. And as it would turn out, a lot of the skills that I picked up in keeping aquariums actually translated into me having a successful career in college and then in research. And as I soon found out, a lot of the concepts that we're familiar with, for instance, cycling an aquarium and how nitrogenous waste is dealt with in an aquarium, translates very well to the ocean. So here we see a very simplistic diagram of the nitrogen cycle. You're all probably pretty familiar with this. You go from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Got to make sure you do your water changes to make sure that the bad stuff doesn't build up. Well, in the ocean, it's the same process. It's just a lot more complicated. And so things like light availability, nutrient cycling, as well as just flow and the movement of water, these things all translated into oceanography. And we often just use a lot more math when we're learning about these things. Another important concept that I remembered from when I was reading about keeping planted tanks was Liebig's law of the minimum. If you have a planted tank or a reef tank, you're, you know the importance of keeping everything in balance and making sure that there's not one nutrient that's limiting. And what Liebig's law says is that growth is going to be limited by whatever the limiting nutrient is. You can keep putting as much CO2 or calcium into your tank, but if there's not enough phosphorus or um, magnesium, then nothing's going to grow. And just like in an aquarium where if things are out of balance or there's an excess of one nutrient, things can go wrong, the same thing can happen in the oceans. After all, what is the ocean but just a really big aquarium? And so this happens all the time where we have runoff from agriculture, which causes uh, huge algae blooms in the ocean. These happen pretty often in the Gulf of Mexico. And after there's an algae bloom, the bacteria processes and eats all that algae, and then it depletes the water of oxygen. And so we end up with fish kills. And so this is just one of the many things that we as oceanographers study, but on a much broader scale. So that, that's how I transitioned from being into uh, fish keeping into marine biology. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Rutgers Center for Fisheries and Ocean Sustainability. And feel free to stop me if you guys have questions. That'll you know, keep you guys from understanding what I'm saying. So, um, we formed the Center for Fisheries and Ocean Sustainability about a year ago now, so we're just getting this off the ground. And our website is fisheries.ruckers.edu. And on our website, you can find a lot more information about our mission. But broadly, we're trying to tackle the many problems that face our fisheries, which people depend on for food, uh, through innovative solutions while maintaining biodiversity. 
And the reason why we created this organization is because Rutgers has more than 20 faculty members that study fisheries in some context. And when I say fishery, I'm talking about not only the, the, the fish that we collect as food, also ornamentals, but also the people that interact with those fish. So the fishermen, the anglers. And so those 20 faculty support more than 25 graduate students and postdoctoral researchers in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different departments. And so we wanted to bring all of those people together to tackle the problems that we're facing. And we face many different areas of research. So we study things like fish and shellfish biology, understanding things at the organism and the ecosystem level, what they eat, how quickly they grow, how long they live. Um, we do things like aquaculture. How can we um, produce shellfish and food fish in a sustainable way to feed uh, society. The effects of climate change. I'm sure you've all heard in the news things like ocean acidification and uh, global warming. These are causing our fish stocks to, to not only change their biology, but also move and live in different places. And so we're studying how these are going to impact fisheries. Things like social ecological systems. Uh, this is becoming more and more popular in our field, not only studying the fish, but also the people that interact with those fish and that are governed by the regulations. Uh, stock assessment science, you may hear a little bit more about this later tonight, but uh, all the, the, many of the fish in the ocean that are caught are managed by management bodies, and it takes a lot of work and math to decide how many fish should be caught each year. And so stock assessments are the science behind what decides that. Things like host-parasite interactions and genetics. And finally, recreational fisheries. Um, how many of you here fish recreationally? Just raise your hands. OK, so a good number of you. So you guys may not think that you have a big impact on the populations and the rivers and the lakes in which you fish. But if you get enough people in a small area, you can have quite a big impact on, on these fish populations. And to help us in our mission, yes? Are, are there stock like, uh, assessments? assessments that are tied to the federal government? Uh, yes, they are. So, so we do some of the science that, that backs those stock assessments. Mm -hmm. And the, those stock assessments help inform the catch limits for the different fisheries. So to help us uh, support ourselves in the mission, we have a number of satellite locations, one of which is the Rutgers University Marine Field Station. It's a retired Coast Guard station that's been converted into a, a, a state-of-the-art science lab. Um, and you can go visit this each September. There's an open house. And at this lab, we do state-of-the-art aging. We do uh, field work. Um, and it's a really nice place to do work because it's it's positioned right upon a marsh. As the director of the field station likes to say, the fish that he studies swim under his office at high tide. And I spent a lot of time here in, in graduate school. We also have the Haskin Shellfish Research Lab and the Aquaculture Innovation Centers. So the Haskin Shellfish Lab has a history that goes back almost 120 years and is credited with the development of tetraploid oysters which in turn are used to make the tetraploid oysters that many of us eat. This means that they're naturally disease resistant um, against many of the diseases that have hurt the industry in the past. We also have a number of research vessels at Rutgers that we use, including the brand new RV Rutgers that's also available for nature tours on the Raritan as well as up and down the coast. We also do a lot of research abroad. So we have colleagues that go to the Philippines and study clownfish genetics, as well as look at how marine protected areas might be used to, to conserve this resource. And then our lab does work in Mongolia, where we study the world's largest salmonid, the taimen. Uh, this fish can get more than six feet in length, and it's a really popular sport fishery that's often on many people's bucket lists. They'll spend between six and $10,000 to go try to catch a taimen. And we're trying to understand the dynamics of this fishery so that, like that it can be sustainable. And so there are many ways that you can get involved. Uh, 
there's Rutgers Day each April on the, the different Rutgers campuses throughout New Jersey. There's the Marine Field Station Open House in Tuckerton each September. And then there are also a number of courses available. Um, Doug teaches the iFish course that you can sign up for if you're interested in learning more about fisheries. And then there are also the RV Rutgers boat trips that are offered pretty regularly. And we're always looking for a helping hand in the field, whether it be on a river, as I'll talk about in a couple minutes, or along the coast and helping us collect data. So now that I've told you about how I became a marine biologist and a little bit about what the Center for Fisheries and Ocean Sustainability does, I want to talk to you about a project that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's a project that we've been doing for seven years now. And when I got into aquariums and reef keeping and that, I always wanted to do work on a coral reef. Um, the problem is I didn't like scuba diving very much. And I didn't like boats. I got pretty seasick. So this limited my options in some ways. And so I ended up working mainly in freshwater systems in my day-to-day -day work. And so I'm going to tell you about evaluating fish passage on the Raritan River. So the species that we're interested in include the American shad and the river herring, which comprise of the blueback herring and the alewife. And all three of these fish species are anadromous which means that they migrate from the oceans to freshwater each year to spawn. You, you probably are familiar with the salmon, which spawns and then dies after it reproduces. These fish are the same in that they migrate to freshwater, but they don't always die each year. And so this uh, map shows the distribution of American shad along the eastern seaboard, but they can also be found along the west coast as they've been introduced there. And believe it or not, along some of the rivers on the west coast, they're actually doing better because they lack the predators and they have a bit more habitat than they do on the east coast. And shad are known as the founding fish. There's a pretty popular book about them because they were a historically valuable fishery. It's thought that they helped some of the first early settlers pass through the winters, and they also helped George Washington's army during the Revolutionary War survive the very harsh winters. Historically, it, it supported a pretty large fishery with more than 50 million pounds of landings each year. However, uh, those populations have declined, and very much so since the 1970s, due to habitat loss from the building of dams along our rivers on the East Coast to pollution. You may be familiar with the Siamonid and different you know, uh, polluters along the Raritan River in particular and then overfishing of the species. And so if you look at this plot here, from 1950 to about 2015, in orange it shows the population decline of river herring and then that of American shad landings. And there have been attempts at restoration from stocking larval fish to helping fish move beyond some of the obstacles that they face to actually removing some of the dams. And so that was the catalyst for our research. Um, let me just go back here. So along the Raritan River, which is in central New Jersey, uh, there have been four dams that have been removed in the last eight years. And so the first obstacle that migrating shad and river herring meet is the island farm weir. And that, that's where we did our work. So the island farm weir is equipped with what's known as a fish ladder or a fish passage device. And all a fish ladder does is it helps a fish move from a lower level of water past a man-made obstacle using a number of different structures. And these structures often include chambers that the fish can use, like a set of steps. And it, they also have what's called attraction water. And the attraction water allows the fish to cue towards that structure, so like that they're not bumping into the dam. And these can take many different shapes and sizes, all the way from backyard projects all the way up to multi-million dollar installations. This one here is the John Day fish ladder um, on the Columbia River. They can even take pretty artistic forms like the spiral staircase fish ladder in Oklahoma. Um, but ultimately, a lot of these fish ladders um, are not evaluated as to how, how well they work and the designers and engineers are often just making a best guess at what would work for the fish in a given river. Um, worldwide, most of the reviews in our field 
have demonstrated that fish ladders don't work all that well. And so we wanted to know how well our local fish ladder was working. And so we partnered up with the New Jersey De Department of Environmental Protection to work on the Raritan River at the Island Farm Weir. Now the Island Farm Weir, I, I had mentioned that some of the dams have been removed along the Raritan. You're probably wondering, well, why can't we just remove this one? Well, it's by the nearby water, American Water Treatment Plant. And so without this, this weir or low head dam, they couldn't maintain the proper water level for their water intakes. So it's not an easy solution to just pull out the dam. And the fish ladder is this small concrete structure here. And so we set out to monitor fish passage using two different methods. The first is we uh, use pit tags. These are um, the size of a Tic Tac. There's no battery in them, and they work just like Easy Pass for fish. So each fish gets its own tag. It gets a number, and we tag the fish using a syringe or a scalpel. And then we can actually monitor how they're moving through the fish ladder using a series of four antennas spaced throughout the fish ladder. We also have a camera system. This camera system is infrared sensitive, which means that it can actually see fish passing by at night um, in complete darkness. And so um, I said how their populations are in decline. It's actually pretty difficult to, to find these fish in the river. You can't just go out there with a fishing pole and catch 10 in a day. And so we actually employ a couple different methods to catch them one of which is to use a custom-made 300-foot-long seine net. Um, most seine nets are 25 or 50 feet long. Ours requires a team of 6 to 10 people to pull, but it allows us to catch all the fish along one side of the river at a time. And we also go out there with fishing poles. This is one of the nicer parts of the job. And so we go out there with a team of experienced anglers, and we try to catch shad using shad darts to tag them. And um, in all this experience, we've depended on volunteers, um, everyone from uh, members of the public to undergraduate students all the way to Rutgers College professors get out there and help us pull this big net. And while, when we pull the net, we catch quite a few fish, and we get the students involved in the data collection and in the tagging process. And many of them um, have never stepped foot in a, in a river or held or even touched a fish. And so they get to experience all this in, in a very nice environment. And we like to think that they come away very passionate about the fish in our local rivers. What kind of fish is that? This one here is a walleye. Wow. Yep, they're, they're pretty sought after by anglers. And so science is all about the data. That's why we do all this. So I'm gonna um, give you guys some of the, the, our findings from the last couple of years. So over seven years, we've managed to catch and tag 50 American shad and 137 river herring. And based on the results from our computer systems at the fish ladder, um, we've had detections from half of the American shad that we tagged that arrived at the entrance of the fish ladder, whereas we've only had five river herring representing three and a, about three and a half percent of the total tagged, so quite a bit lower than the American shad. We've also had the first demonstration of what's called iteroparity. Iteroparity means repeated spawning. So we talked about salmon earlier where they only spawn once during their lifetimes. Uh, we demonstrated for the first time that river herring actually return year after year to the same body of water. And then if we look at how many fish successfully exited the fish ladder, um, those numbers drop. So for American shad, we had 19 go through the fish ladder, representing 38%. And unfortunately, we only had two river herring successfully pass through the fish ladder that were tagged, representing about 1.5% of those. So I mentioned that we have four antennas, and so we're able to use our inner two antennas to tell us a bit more about the movement of the fish through the fish ladder. And by looking at the data, we found that many of the fish that don't make it through the fish ladder spend as much time near this first entrance antenna than those that pass all the way through. 
So we had fish that spent up to 10 days just going in and out of this one antenna entrance and not going beyond there. And so we have a couple ideas why that might be. So if you look at, at this aerial photograph, this is the weir, and you have a lot of water spilling over. This is the main spillway. And then here's where the attraction water comes out. And this is controlled by a series of valves. And this water is supposed to attract the fish to the fish ladder entrance. The entrance of the fish ladder, which is there, is only about four feet wide. And so the fish swimming upriver have to find this entrance by using this attraction water. Now, it's pretty clear that maybe the signal coming from that attraction water is swamped by all the water rushing downstream. These fish cue to laminar flow as their cue to move upriver. Um, we've also spent a lot of time in the fish ladder itself each spring when we're uh, getting it ready for the season. It, it opens every March, and then we close it again in July or August. And in that entrance room, that first chamber, there are a number of large metal grates. And we often find that these metal grates get flipped over when there's a, a big storm. And so this could create a very bubbling, churning uh, water movement pattern, which these species are thought to not like. They like laminar flow. And so this combination of ha having difficulty finding the, the entrance, as well as this water movement pattern, might be why we're not seeing good passage rates. And of course, we'd hope that we'd have a 100% passage rate for these fish to move up river and access their spawning habitat. Um, I also mentioned that we, we record video. Um, so we have a team of very dedicated students that review this video footage every year. So we record 24-7 for three months. And over the seven years of the project, we've made over 21,000 observations of fish moving and species identifications. We've also identified an invasive species within the Raritan River, the flathead catfish. And we're currently finishing up the 2018 footage we hope to be done this month. And so here's what, what our equipment looks like. It's a security camera with two car batteries and then a computer recording system in a Pelican case. And so I, I've used a lot of my skills that I, I you know, developed keeping aquariums to put together this equipment. And so here, this is an American shad moving through the fish ladder, the flathead catfish, and then this is a shot of a channel catfish at night. Question. Yes. We're not sure. Um, they, they were likely introduced to, to the river, but they may have been, been brought on someone's boat or in someone's live well, but they, they were not thought to previously be living in the Raritan River. So uh, fish can get introduced in quite a number of ways. And so we can take all of the, our, our data points and we can plot them and tell us some pretty cool things. So this is a plot of by year, each row is a separate year, and then this is the week from March through July. And the darker the red color, the more fish we observe passing through the fish ladder. And so we can do this for all the different fish that, that we see in the Raritan, and we can look for different uh, migration patterns. So some fish, like the American shad, have a pretty pronounced migration pattern, whereas more resident fish might have, like the quillback, might not, or might show a more um, dispersed migration pattern. And so we're looking at, at, through all these patterns with a couple students, and we want to relate them to things like temperature and water flow to see what's driving these relationships. We also use our video data to help us target catching these fish, as I mentioned, we, we sort of have to get the timing of the run correctly in order to catch and tag them. And so if you look at the, the passage of American shad on the top or river herring, they typically come at about the same time between late April and early May, but there are anomalous years like 2016. Maybe it was warmer earlier this year or there was an early storm that those fish queued to. And so we're we're lucky to have the USGS have water monitoring stations in the river, and they have them across the country, where they take things like temperature, discharge, water height. And so these plots show 
um, the water discharge in blue over each year, and then in orange we have uh, the cumulative count of American shad, so just the count, the sum total, the running total for each day. And so we see in years like 2014 and 2015, after there's a high water event, a lot of rain comes through, we see a quick uptick in the number of American shad passing through. So we're beginning to look at these patterns that can help us determine when we should be targeting these fish. We can also age our fish. Um, so we can't just ask a fish how old it is. We need to look at um, hard parts in the fish, much in the way you'd look at a tree stump and count the annular tree rings that are formed due to seasonal differences. Fish, many fish actually exhibit the same thing in their scales and their otoliths or ear bones. And so a lot of what our lab does is actually removes otoliths and then fish scales and then counts the rings to age them. And so for the 2017 shad, we found that most of them were, were between ages four and six. And this helps us uh, learn about when they make their migration, their initial migration from the oceans into the river to spawn. This helps us manage the fishery. Um, something really cool that we've done in the last couple years is we got a grant from the Sustainable Raritan River Initiative to actually put in some solar panels and a really big cell modem. And so what we do is we actually transmit a live feed of the, the fish ladder footage over the internet. And so from April through June, you can log on to our website and you can actually watch fish swimming through the fish ladder. And we did this with a, a team of undergraduate students. And in a way, this brings everything full circle to me because I went from having my small fish tank at home to having the whole river as my aquarium that I can share with everyone. Yes. We, we don't have a study right now on the, on the striped bass migration, but we're looking at their, uh, their early habitat that they use. So which rivers along New Jersey they spend, a, they spend time in. And the way we're doing that is we're actually removing their otoliths and we're looking at chemical signatures in their otoliths. So that I actually have to work on the final report that's due in a month on that one. So you should be seeing results about that from the DEP pretty soon. And so you can go on our website, um, like I said, between April and June, and you can take a look at the, the fish cam, as we like to call it. And a student put together this website that allows people to see exactly what they're looking at. And with that, I'd like to thank the funders of this project, the New Jer Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, as well as uh, the different institutions that have helped us over the course of the seven-year project, the Rucker Sustainable Raritan River Initiative, New Jersey American Water Company, and the New Jersey Water Supply Authority. And finally, I'd like to give another big thanks to all of our volunteers that have helped us over the years. And some additional resources, I can send them out to, to Paul or Bill, and they can share them with you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Doug Zemeckis. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me here tonight, the opportunity to share with you some of our additional work from Rutgers. As Anthony mentioned, I'm all affiliated with the Center for Fisheries and Ocean Sustainability, but I'm uh, extension faculty, which is off-campus faculty. I'm affiliated with the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources, uh, and that's part of Cooperative Extension. Anyone? Too loud. <laughs> Too loud. I think it's off. Is it on still? That's on. All right. Good. Good. Uh, anyone familiar with the term Cooperative Extension? A couple people, probably with agriculture mostly. I'll, I'll give a brief over, overview with Cooperative Extension. So today I'm going to give an overview of Cooperative Extension, New Jersey's fisheries. I'm going to focus in on a study that we did on black sea bass. A lot of people raised their hands before that they like to fish. How many people like to fish for black sea bass? That's great. At least how many people like to eat black sea bass? All right. So most of us have an invested interest in the sustainability of black sea bass. All right, I'm originally from Edison, New Jersey, born and raised, grew up going down to uh, Normandy Beach, uh, fishing recreationally wherever I can get a rod in my hand. Uh, I similarly went to Rutgers, got a degree in marine sciences, spent seven years living in New England, studying recreational commercial fishers up there. Been back here in New Jersey for about three years now, worked on campus. Now, as I mentioned, I'm an off-campus extension faculty member, uh, working with fisheries, aquaculture, and coastal resource management. I'm a county extension agent, so I work on the county level. I focus in an ocean, Monmouth, Atlantic counties. 
Uh, anyone ever dating back to history here? So the Morrill Act back in, let me test myself, 1862, set up the uh, land-grant university system. This was in response to the Industrial Revolution. At the time, a lot of the education going on throughout the country focused in on the core principles, mathematics, English as examples. This is what really got uh, mechanic arts or engineering going uh, at universities and agriculture, with a heavy agriculture focus. Rutgers became the land-grant university, so as the land-grant university, we serve the state of the university to meet the needs of the citizens of the state through research and educational programming. Uh, and that's where, uh, in this case, Rutgers carries out that land-grant gr land grant mission. Most people are familiar with it through our agricultural research, uh, but we do a lot more than just that. Here today, I'm representing fisheries and aquaculture, work in environmental and natural resources throughout the state. Uh, modern day home ec is uh, 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 food, nutrition, and health educational programming for the state of U university. Uh, horticultural, or agri uh, recreational agriculture, uh, youth and community de development. And as a land grant mission, we have faculty on campus, which you heard about, who do a lot of the applied research. And my job as an extension agent is to take that wealth of information out to the public. So uh, you might say my job is to teach anybody but the students of the university. So this is my job this evening, talking to a variety of fishing clubs, educate fishermen, people wanting to get involved with aquaculture, and members of the general public. So Cooperative Extension has actually been around for over 100 years, and we have faculty throughout the whole state of New Jersey. And our job is to do educational programming to carry out that land-grant mission to meet the needs of the citizens and industry of our state of New Jersey. And like I mentioned, I focus in on fisheries, aquaculture, and coastal resource management. Now, so that's just an overview of the angle from which I come at, uh, at my, my education and research. Uh, on a related note, if you're starting to like the flavor about the things in which I'm talking, uh, you heard Anthony mentioned iFish, uh, Introductory Fisheries Science for Stakeholders. It's a course that we have at Rutgers. It starts at the end of this month. It meets every Tuesday night, and it goes over fishery science, biology, and management, and it's geared towards fishermen and the public so that way they can understand the science and management that goes into our industries. If you have any interest, I'm passing around flyers on that. Uh, if you'd like to ask me any questions after class, or after, <laughs> after the talk. <laughs> I, I, I speak from anywhere to youth groups, to senior citizens, and in between and on campus. Ex please excuse me. Uh, in addition to the course, we have other educational seminars. We have one coming up at the end of this month on the January 28th, which is about the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal. It's a pretty ne neat tool. They, they have data from all over different industries, shipping and fisheries, uh, mapping what goes on in our oceans off the coast. So you can take a look at that as well if you're interested. And make sure you play cl cl pay close attention because at the end there's a test. But this is, but this is a real unique test because you actually get to grade me. Uh, Bill told me to give you a heads up. At the end, you get to grade me and how, how well I'm doing. So a unique, unique opportunity to grade the teacher. Uh, all right. So anybody without looking, i got to blindfold these slides. What's commercial fishing in the seafood industry worth to the state of New Jersey? Any guesses without looking back behind me? 100 million. Ah, uh, higher. Higher. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. $2.1 billion value added to the state economy in New Jersey alone, and that's from 2015. Over 31,000 jobs. These are the primary fishing ports from Monmouth County down through Cape May, plus Port Norris down on, uh, down on Delaware Bay. Those are the primary commercial fishing ports. Uh, overall, in terms of the value, uh, farm gate value, you would call it, or X vessel price in fisheries, it could be worth up to $220 million or just what the product's worth to the fishermen directly on their boat. Then you have multiplier effects of how valuable that is once it starts hitting the processors and the restaurants and state economy. Any guesses? Uh, it's already given away up there. I gotta prepare better for that, but sea scallops are the most profitable wild marine fishery we have here in New Jersey. It could be worth just up to over $110 million to the, to the boat alone. It is the most, second most valuable fishery in the Northeast behind American lobster. Uh, 50 to 100 foot boats fishing typically 15 foot dredges. This is what we're used to seeing the sea scallops look like on our dinner plate, but this is an adult sea scallop. They're shucked at sea. These are the mussels that are brought in. The rest of the guts go overboard. Uh, so it's very manual labor to operate this gear and to shuck all the scallops at sea. Hence, part plus the demand why we pay so much. Uh, surf clams and ocean cohogs is the me next most profitable fishery in the state of New Jersey, commercially. And then blue crabs, primarily Delaware Bay, but we've seen a large increase in Barnegat Bay in the last decade. 
So as you notice, that's all shellfish so far. We're finally getting to a finfish. Summer flounder, monkfish, and lobster are the top six commercial species, at least from 2006 to 15. Next up, again, a blindfold test. How much is recreational fishing worth to the state of New Jersey in 2015? Any guesses? 20 billion. 20 billion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if so, there, there would uh, be more of me uh, to teach about it. $1.2 billion to the state economy, e uh, economic impacts. So quite a sizable industry as well. Yes, sir? Uh, the, this report was just updated, and it includes only through 2016 data, and the numbers stayed damn near, darn near the same. Um, yep, gas prices, uh, yeah, yep. I bet you it was even higher before the gas prices still started jumping up, but you're referring to probably like summer flounder regs and black sea bass regs? Yep. Yep. That'd be interesting. I can go back and pull the reports from way back, when, even before 2015, when those regs really started getting strict to see how it's changed. Yep. So in addition, 16,000 jobs, and a lot of this is sales. Uh, as you see, uh, fish, think of them like shoes. We buy a lot of tackle, boats, fuel, engines that goes into these estimates of the total economic impacts. Uh, what's interesting is we have about 1 to 1.2 million anglers who participate in recreational fishing, marine here in New Jersey, and about half of them come from out of state. Uh, so it's a major tourism drive as well, not just people from, uh, you know, within the state of New Jersey. Uh, and about 4 to 7 million individual trips are taken each year. Again, interestingly, about half of them are shore-based. The rest, you see private boat anglers and uh, for hire, so that's the party and charter boats. Uh, the most, not necessarily the most valuable, but the most commonly caught species are uh, summer flounder, black sea bass, um, skipping over the, the nitty details, bluefish, striped bass, and blackfish or tatag. So those are the most popular. So now I'm going to, any general questions before I dive into black sea bass? Okay. Have at it, I'm, I can take them. What? <coughs> yep. Yep. Okay, I'll give you a broadened answer to that. So I'll talk. I'll start with summer flounder, and then I'll compare it to black sea bass. So summer flounder has what's called a conservation equivalency. So there's the stock assessment, which estimates how many fish are in the ocean. Naturally, it sounds diff easy, right? It's just like counting trees, but. Actually not. They're underwater and they move. So there is high uncertainty in that estimate. So a stock assessment estimates how many fish are in the ocean. That tells us biologically how many we could take. Each state gets their cut of the pie. Conservation equivalently for summer flounder lets each state determine their own regulations. That's why each state is different. Black sea bass is not, they're trying to potentially get conservation equivalency. Right now it's regional. So it's, it's on a regional basis where they work that out, not just at a state level. So you'll, that's why you'll see different things. Each state has the opportunity to change their minimum sizes, possession limits, and seasons to fit within what they've been allocated. So for example, Rhode Island has a larger minimum size for sea bass, but they also have a shorter season and overall s a, sh a smaller quota than New Jersey. That, pretty good, okay. Was there another one? Okay. All right, so here's, uh, in 2017, NOAA came out with their updated report to estimate how many sea bass are in the ocean. Uh, this is the spawning stock biomass, which is a measure of the number of reproductive fish in the ocean by weight of black sea bass. And this goes from North Carolina through Maine. This is where they would like the population to be at. And as you can see, the population is very healthy. It's about four times the, the, the needed level for sustainable fishery. The fishing mortality rate is below, which means we're removing fish currently at a healthy level. You don't want to go above this line. You don't want to go below that line. That would uh, call in to need more strict management measures. So the population is quite healthy right now of black sea bass. Uh, this shows the recreational and commercial catch from 1989 to 2015. The bottom white bars are the commercial landings. The dark are the discarded fish from commercial fishery. So the top two dash lines are recreational landings and recreational catch uh, discards. Uh, in 2015, about 61% of the total catch is estimated to be from the recreational fishery. So that's North Carolina through Maine. 
Uh, the allocations are close, I forgot what the exact percentage is, but they're closer to 50-50, um, but it could have, it, recreational caught perhaps a little more than they were allocated and commercial fishery maybe underfished. Uh, so recreational fishery plays a major role in black sea bass. Uh, currently right now they assume from catch and release, so if it's out of season too small or you have your limit, you have to throw the fish back or some people practice catch and release uh, based upon their own conservation measures. They assume 15% that are caught and released die and that gets caught towards, counted towards the quota every year. It accounted for in 2015 a little over 1 million fish that were thrown back that ultimately were assumed to die across the, down along the coast. So most of the recreational fishery happens in state waters within three miles of the beach, 75% uh, of the catch and 82% of the discards. So in 2009, they, uh, NOAA published a study where they put tags on black sea bass. They tagged them all the way from Cape Cod down into North Carolina. Uh, this is where they tagged the fish and this is where they were later recaptured. You see a lot of the fish were caught in along the coast, but also many of them were caught offshore by both recreational and commercial fishermen. The sea bass show a general inshore, offshore, or north-south migration where they overwinter in deep waters. So most of the fishery happens inshore, but there's also an offshore fishery during the winter because we get bored and lazy on December and used to be in January, want to get out fishing, so uh, most of the striped bass are gone by then. Uh, it is a pretty popular fishery going for black sea bass during the winter. These, these are electronic archival tags, so they record depth and temperature. They were attached to black sea bass as part of this study. They're released, and when a fisherman catches them, the tags come back, and you can get information on the depth and the temperature the fish experienced. If you take it a step level, you can then recreate where the fish migrated to based upon this information by comparing about what we know about the oceanography. But what to show here is some of these fish in January, February, March, they're in 150 meters or over 500 feet deep both of these two fish that were tagged off Rhode Island. So th they go inshore, offshore, and they overwinter in these deeper waters. And recreational fishermen go after them in deeper waters. So in this study, we were uh, interested in estimating the catch and release discard mortality rate. So many factors can influence whether or not a fish lives when you catch and release it. So if you picture you hooked a fish, you brought it to the surface, and you threw it back, if that's the time, uh, there's cumulative stress along the way, which might kill, uh, lead to mortality. Uh, there could be capture impacts if the fish is gut hooked or foul hooked. Uh, different species and sizes of fish are more vulnerable to mortality and stress. Temperature differences, uh, air exposure, of course, when you're taken out of the water, uh, exposure to light, or delayed mortality, perhaps due to infection or predation by sharks and birds after you throw them back. So there's a lot of things that can happen be between catch and release for an animal to live. Uh, and working in 20 to 40 feet of water off Cape Cod, it was estimated that only 5% of black sea bass die after you catch and release them. So they're very resilient to the, uh, catch and release and that stress in shallow water. But there's uh, evidence of increased mortality as you move deeper. 19% off North Carolina were estimated to die in 65 to 115 feet. And moving deeper, 39% uh, estimate to die in 140 to 180 feet off South Carolina. Anyone know what might lead to higher mortality in deeper depths? Pressure change, barotrauma, exactly. You, it, we know where we are here. So anyone remember Boyle's Law from high school physics or maybe college physics? So the way Boyle's Law works is when you bring the fish up from depth to the surface, there's a decrease in pressure, which leads to an increase in volume. Thanks to Anthony for his great artwork here. But this is the swim bladder shown in blue of a black sea bass that's full of gases, which regulate the buoyancy of the fish. So that way they don't sink or float when they're normally behaving. When you bring them up rapidly, decrease in pressure, and the swim bladder volume expands. That creates a bunch of internal injuries in the fish. Here's a normal black sea bass showing minimal signs of barotrauma. Here's what we call stomach aversion, where when that swim bladder expands, it forces the stomach out the mouth. In this case, it calls, causes what we call exothalmia, which is bulging of the eyes. In some species, it can cause the organs to uh, descend out through the anus or also gas bubbles under the skin. So what we wanted to do in this study was to estimate the survival rate of black sea bass that experience these symptoms in deep water. Figure out what causes them to die and then come up with ways that we can increase their survival when we have to catch and release them when you unfortunately can't keep them if they're too small or if you have too many or they're out of season. And then do things like I am here tonight to talk to a variety of people about how to best handle them. So we've done this work when I lived in New England. We've done it with cod, little winter barn door skates, haddock, cusk, and thorny skates. So it's a well-tested statistical method. I won't go into the details. And in this case, we applied it to black sea bass. 
Anthony mentioned one another type of tag earlier. Here's a, a third type of electronic tag. It's an acoustic transmitter, like Easy Pass for Fish, as Anthony mentioned. We affix these tags to the back of the black sea bass. They emit a low frequency sound signal, so that's like the transponder in your car. And then we put receivers out, which are like the toll gates on the parkway, to track where the fish move to see if they lived or died or not. And we use their movements to estimate survival, which I'll get into. We had volunteer anglers go out on offshore trips with us, fishing with party boats out of CL City in Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, we over eight different trips from December through March two years ago. We tagged over 1,800 fish working at these three locations, 50 to 70 miles from Seattle City. Uh, we recorded this whole suite of information on every fish that we caught. It was quite the production. As you might imagine, there's a lot of things that can lead to the mortality of a black sea bass catch and release. Uh, so we want to standardize some. Everyone used the same hooks. Uh, that You were allowed to use their own rod and reels, but everyone used the same high-low rig 5.0 hooks. And we recorded things like capture depth, angler experience, how many times they've been fishing, as an example. The fight time, every fisherman had a stopwatch. We measured how long to rail the fish to the surface, how long it was out of the water, and how long it took to unhook it to see if that impacts the survival. Where it was hooked on the fish, in different zones, how the fish was unhooked and who did it. We measured the length of the fish, air temperature, bottom, sea surface, water temperature. When we threw it back, we measured to see how it behaved right away, if it floated, sank, or swam erratically. Uh, injury score, did it or did it not have a wound? And was it, what size was the wound? Uh, and it, did it have barotrauma? Was the stomach coming out of the mouth? If so, how far? And were the eyes bulging? So we recorded everything, well, I don't know, it was maybe 15 things for every one of those 1,800 black sea bass to tell what might be a predictor of whether or not they lived or died or not. So we, in addition, we caught and released the fish at the surface, and we want to see if we can do any intervening measures. Oh, so I don't... Bust it. Can you bring me that box over there? I forgot something. Thank you. We want to see what the survival rate is. We catch or release them at the surface, but then we want to see if we can increase their survival in any way. Thank you, Paul. So what we tested was what's called swim bladder venting, which is using a hypodermic needle to puncture that that's a, Hyperder uh, hypodermic needle to puncture the swim bladder right behind that pectoral fin to release the gases, which we wanted to test to see if it improved the ability of the sea bass to go back down and if it also increased their survival. I'll pass around that tool. It there is a needle on it, so please be careful. It comes out the white end if you push the orange trigger. Uh, an alternative to using that, that's much quicker, but if you had more time, you can also use what's called a descending device. If it's like a boga grip, you can lip the fish, weight it, and send it down. It's pressure released to open at a program depth to get the fish down away from bird and fish predators as another option. This sequelizer is about 60 bucks. Yeah, we didn't test that in this case. We did the venting. A cheaper alternative to that is this Rockley's fish descender. You tie into it with your line. You put a weight on it. You put this on the lip of the fish. When you get down to what you think is a good depth, you start reeling and the fish slides off. The objective with these tools is to get them down away from predators and back to the pressure they came from. In this study, we tested venting with the swim bladder, which is poking a hole in the swim bladder, releasing the gases. Here are the 30 receivers. This is what they look like. Spaced around the shipwreck, which was in the center. This was a freighter that was sunk by the Germans in the 40s. A cool history behind the wreck. And now we're studying black sea bass around it. So when we, t we tagged all the fish at the wreck, and we could see how they behaved when we caught and released them. And this is the data we got back from them. This is a fish that's a positive control. We know this fish lived. We tagged it, we tracked it, and someone caught it el somewhere else. We know it lived. So this is the depth information we get to tag. You can see it's high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. Here's the depth. Every now and then it comes off the bottom. It eventually moves deeper and it leaves. You see it hangs out by the wreck, eventually it leaves. We know that's an alive fish. In contrast, here's a fish that we know is dead. We put a $700 tag on a dead fish because this information is so valuable. 62 days. Never moved. So we compare, our tag, we compare our tag fish to those fish to determine if they lived or died or not. That's the core behind our statistical method. There was another fate, which was predation. We had 9 out of 96 fish that we think were eaten by dogfish or bluefish. The movement doesn't match any of our controls. Erratic, off-bottom movement behavior, swimming at a very high rate. So we had fish that lived, died, and died that were eaten. So overall, 95% of the fish had some symptoms of barotrauma. The most common was stomach aversion score 2, where the stomach was coming out of the mouth. The eyes were bulging in about 10% of the fish, and generally barotrauma was more prevalent at deeper depths. So what this shows here are the three different depths. 
fish that we vented and fish we didn't vent, fish that floated in black, fish that swam down in gray. And overall, if you compare by the different depths, the fish that were vented had a greater probability of swimming down than fish that were uh, unvented. So vented, venting increased the likelihood of the fish going back down, which is objective number one. You want to get away from any birds or other fish and sharks that could eat them. We then want to know, did they also live more if they went back down or were vented? So this is what people get PhD f PhDs for to figure out the statistics behind this, and I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm just going to show you one nice graph. So out of the 94 fish, we tagged. So we tagged 94 with those $700 tags. We had 1,800 fish total. We used that subsample to predict for the larger number of fish. 61 were alive, 33 dead, nine predation events. Uh, but that, we then used that to look at the whole sample. Uh, we found this subsample, 80% of mortality occurred within the first 24 hours, which was interesting. Uh, so we threw all those variables from that table into these statistical models to tell us, ask what determines whether or not a sea bass lives or dies. And it could have been very hairy with all those different variables, but it came out amazingly clean. Uh, very high statistical power. The most significant predictor if a sea bass lived or died was whether or not it was vented with that venting tool. So here's the mean average probability of survival for black sea bass at 150 feet of water if you did not vent it, 50%. Using that venting tool, which takes two to four seconds, increased the average survival to 79%. So a 30% increase in survival by using that quick tool to vent the swim bladder. So therefore, it shows efficacy and value to use that tool, but mo maybe you don't have a venting tool on your boat, maybe you don't want to use it, uh, so what is, determines the survival in fish that were not vented? Looking deeper into these fish in the red, the most significant predictor of whether or not those fish lived or died after venting, statistically much more, much less weight, but this, in number two ranking was the, the length of the fight. If you fought the fish for longer than 54 seconds and did not vent it, it only had about a 25, 28% survival probability. Not venting the fish and reeling in for a shorter amount of time, it had about a 70% survival probability. So it's actually better in this case to get the fish in at a moderate to fast pace, probably uh, an interaction between the barotrauma and the stress. So the best things you can do are reel them in at a moderate to fast pace and use that venting tool in when you're catching black sea bass in the deep water. So just a quick, a lot of people think that that's the uh, swim bladder coming out of the mouth, but that's actually the stomach forced out by the expansion of the swim bladder when the fish are experiencing barotrauma. Uh, based upon our results, the best thing you could do to increase their survival would be use uh, one intervening measure. We tested swim bladder venting. When you have fish with barotrauma, you have to throw back. Uh, the w those descending devices might work as well or even better. We haven't yet had funding to test them. Uh, and it's important to know the right place so you don't poke the wrong organs. This was a study where they looked at the different spots where an angler would have uh, vented a uh, red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the approximate area of the swim bladder. You can see maybe the white dots. Uh, that's important. That's why I'm here. Part of why I'm here. I don't have fish today, but to show people who might be doing this on the proper places to vent this fish. This does have implications. Of course, I'll tie it into we're here at the North uh, Jersey Shore Aquarium Society. Um, when I, we were doing a lot of uh, other research up in New England, we were working with the New England Aquarium. We brought uh, tried to bring cusk, haddock, uh, cod, and other species back to the New England Aquarium. And in addition to monitoring the proper temperatures, these types of handling practices were done to ensure it and hopefully maximize their survival. And there's now a George's Bank ecosystem tank up in the New England Aquarium. Many of those fish came from these studies. So in addition to venting, the next best thing you can do is reel them up at a moderate or fast pace. So fish as shallow as possible is one recommendation. If you know you can catch the fish in 120 feet and also 70, fish in the shallower location might be an option. Use the appropriate strength tackle because the weaker tackle took longer to fight the fish. It was a higher amount of stress. Uh, consider how many hooks you use to reduce double headers because double headers had a large, longer fight time. Sometimes people use three, four, five hooks. If you're going to be discarding some small fish, maybe use a couple smaller hooks. Uh, reel in uh, fish at a moderate to fast pace to reduce that uh, stress. Um, avoid fishing in locations and seas when black sea bass retention is prohibited. Uh, right now, this time of year in January, March, it's closed, so any black sea bass have to be discarded. So keep that in mind if you're fishing for cod, pollock, or, or porgies. Avoid high grading, which is throwing back keeper sized fish. Minimum size is 12 and a half, so maybe don't throw back that 13 inch fish waiting for the 14, 15. If it's keeper, maybe consider keeping it, given that there's a chance it might die. Uh, 
And this is more for fishery managers, but we found that mortality appears to be worse at the deeper depths, and the predators are around, the fish move progressively deeper, and the predators are around early. So if they're worried about discards, there might be a time where uh, this information can be used for setting their seasons as well. This funding was, this project was funded by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. I presented this to the Management Council last year for their consideration in determining management measures for this winter fishery, which they did so for this year. We worked with the Partnership for Mid-Atlantic Fishery Science, recreational commercial fishermen from Sea Isle and Cape May, volunteers, scientists who came out and helped catch fish. It didn't always look like that. We had some pretty rough days, days starting at one in the morning, uh, but that's how it goes. So. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have.